GP Motorcycle Event. We hope you'll enjoy your ride around the track. And in consideration of all of our guests, for the next 10 minutes or so, please turn off your cell phones. Thanks. The 500 was held for the first time in 1911, but the track was already in its third year, built early in 1909 as a testing facility for the thriving automobile industry. Many famous makes were from here, like Marmon, National and Cole, with the best known ones coming a little later on with Stutz, maker of the famous Bearcat, then right after World War I with the Duesenberg brothers. Indiana roads were still a few years away from being paved, so there was nowhere to really find out what an automobile could do and what its weak points might be. This track would solve that problem. Not only could the manufacturers test here privately, but occasional races would give the spectators a chance to see in competition what they could go down to the showrooms and purchase. The man who created all of this was Carl Fisher, the very same man who would later develop Miami Beach from Swamplands into an exotic resort area. He also developed Long Point on Long Island and spearheaded the we first drivable highway across the United minutes. States. We enter the track between turns one and two at the south end short straightaway. Up ahead is turn two. There are four turns, each measuring exactly one quarter of a mile from entrance to exit. 
and they are banked at 9 degrees and 12 minutes. The main straightaway, which we will be seeing in about 5 minutes, and the backstretch, coming up in just a moment, each cover 5 eighths of a mile, so that the entire track is 2.5 miles around. From time to time along the way, you'll see some of the portions of the road course built between 1999 and 2000 and revised in 2008. It winds through the infield and links back up with the oval over to the northwest. On the right are the original VIP suites built in 1973. We are riding on the very same two and a half miles used by the drivers 100 years ago. Only the surface has changed. During the fall of 1909, down went 3,200,000 paving bricks, which is why the track still carries the nickname, the Brickyard. And where are the bricks today? Well, about 85% of the way around, they're still there, buried under several layers of asphalt. The most recently paving job took place in the fall of 2004. If you think you may have spotted a golf course on either side of us, well, you have. It dates back to 1929. It's been revamped a couple of times since, most recently in 1993, by the world-famous Pete Dye, who used to live in Indianapolis. There are now four holes inside the track and 14 over on the right. The old course was once a major stop on the PGA Tour, the 500 Open being held between 1960 and 68. Each September between 1994 and 2000, the seniors played here. The 3-2-1 markers over on the outside fence are 100-yard reference points for entering turn three. The 500 drivers will make the turn at about 220 miles an hour. The NASCAR drivers with cars which are double the weight will go through at about 170 miles an hour. The fastest laps ever completed here by 500 drivers have been right at 240 miles an hour. That means negotiating a two and a half mile lap in less than 38 seconds. Or to put it another way, it's the equivalent of traveling down a football field in about nine tenths of one second. When we are in the turns, you can see the faint safer barriers up against the walls. They have done much to absorb the energy in the event of an accident resulting in wall contact. Safer barriers are coming into more and more use at major tracks, but the very first one was installed at this one in 2002. Carl Fisher had three partners, one of whom was James Allison, founder of the famed Allison Engineering. They sold the Speedway in 1927 to a group headed up by World War I flying ace, Captain Eddie Rickenbacker, who had in fact been a regular 500 driver before he ever learned how to fly a plane. In 1945, the track was sold to Anton Holman Jr. of Terre Haute, and it has remained in the Holman George family for over 60 years. Over on the left are the final turns of the road course on their way to linking up again with the Oval. Out of turn four and onto the main straightaway, corporate suites and double-decker grandstands. Can you imagine going all the way down there in nine seconds? Drivers making pit stops used to drive all the way down the straight and pull over to their respective pit. In 1957, a separated pit lane was installed, and it may have been the first of its kind anywhere in the world. The current 500 cars have to stop several times during the race. They'll take on fuel and change four wheels in less than 10 seconds. And they don't use gasoline. From 1965 until 2006, everyone used methanol. Starting in 2007, the 500 cars have run on ethanol. NASCAR, however, does use gasoline, but blended with 15% ethanol. The tall building on the left is called the Pagoda. It was completed in 2000. This is where the master control tower stood from 1957 until 1998. And prior to 57, a Japanese-style pagoda occupied this spot, and that's the reason for this current design. This one, however, has 10 floors and rises to the equivalent of a 13-story building. At ground level, and slightly over to the left, is the current winner's circle for the 500 and Brickyard 400 
and just above it, the rostrum for the top three finishes in the MotoGP motorcycle race. The start-finish line isn't hard to locate, it's marked by a strip of bricks. As late as 1961, when A.J. Foyt won his first 500, the greater part of the main straight was still of bricks and mortar. And imagine that prior to the late 1930s, the entire two and a half miles looked like that, and it made for a pretty rough ride. Well, when you've been around for 104 years like the Indianapolis Motor Speedway has, you attend the established tradition. Several of them take place in this area. In 1936, Louis Meyer comes to the racetrack attempting to be the first driver to win the 500 three times. As a youth growing up, his mother told him, when you've had a hard day, when you're tired, when you need a pick-me-up, the best thing that you can do is drink buttermilk. Louis comes to the track 1936, brings his buttermilk with him, he wins. He's down in victory lane, the crew hands him the milk, he's drinking the milk, click, 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 click. All the photographers down there, next morning on the front page, all the papers across the country, Louis Meyer, first three-time winner, Indianapolis 500, drinks milk in victory lane. Well, the milk foundation, as it was known then, said, hey, we're on to something here, aren't we? We'll ride that horse. So now, the 33 dollars drivers that qualify for the 500 on the last Monday in May, they go to them several days before the race and say, should you win on Sunday, what kind of milk do you want? Two percent, low fat, skim, whole, whatever they want, they'll have that type available to them. Got to be white. They can't order chocolate or strawberry. They don't pull the drink. All right. So now, in 1992, NASCAR came here and tested. 1994, the Speedway and NASCAR agreed that there would be a NASCAR race here. The Brickyard 400 was born. The first one won by Jeff Gordon. Well, 1996, Dale Jarrett wins the first of his two Brickyard 400s. He and his crew are celebrating over here at Victory Circle. And all at once, he and his crew chief come and leap across pit lane, come out to the yard of bricks, kneel down, turn their hands around, kiss the bricks. I can only surmise out of respect for all the other great drivers who had won here and how happy they were to have won and to be a part of the race here at the World's Greatest Race Corps. So now, anyone who wins a race, they go out and they kiss the bricks. If you're familiar with Helio Castro Nevis in the eyes of Indy Car Series, his stick is whatever he wins a race, he climbs a fence. 2001, 2002, 2009, he's won here. Pulls over here at the start finish line, unhooks his belt, gets out, climbs the fence. Well, the fans are going nuts, enjoying him uh, having a good time, and he's enjoying them having a good time with him. So from behind, he's got on a, he's got on a red driver's suit and a red helmet, and he's climbing that fence. He kind of looks like that guy called Spider-Man. Okay, so some people around here kind of talk to you about that sometimes, Spider-Man. Well, folks, I don't have any milk for him, Frank, I'm sorry. And we would ask if you don't go across pit road, because there may be service vehicles up and down. And please don't stand on pit wall to take pictures. We didn't win a race, so we can't climb the fence. Now, one thing we can do, even though we didn't win a race, we can go out and kiss the bricks, all right? Now, what I want you to do, or what you can do, leave any of your paperwork on here, because you don't want to be bothered with your books, history books, or whatever, but you certainly want to bring your cameras. Now, uh, I am technologically challenged with some of these cameras, but still, you can probably give me a quick tutorial, and well, Jack and I'll help you take pictures if you'd like to get a group shot out there. So, let's get out and let's go kiss some bricks. Learn, please, so, thank you very much. Go ahead, Up ahead is the scoring pylon. It went up in 1994 to replace the one there since 59. It's anchored in 22 feet of concrete, and the windsock is 97 feet off the ground. How many 30-watt bulbs are there in it? 6,496. On the left is the entrance to the Speedway's famed garage area and gasoline alley, which, while having changed in appearance over the years, has been back at that approximate location since 1914. We can't see it from here because of the trackside Formula One garages built in 2000. Further down here on the left, just before we enter the turn, is where Victory Lane used to be from 1919 until 1970. Between 1947 and 59, Hollywood actresses were part of the post-race ceremonies, among them, in 1958, a very young Shirley MacLaine. 
Here we are in the famous Turn 1. On the infield, there is now a four-turn addition to the road course. Combined with the modification to the complex north of the museum, the number of turns to the road course now stands at 16. That brings us to the south end once again to approximately where we started. A 500 driver at speed would have lapped us. Oh, probably about 15 or 16 times. Well, let's, let's multiply that by about two and a half if we stopped took all those pictures, right? Now, uh, Jack just advised me, folks, we hit 42. Yeah. This first four turns of the road course, this is used by the motorcycles only when they're here in August. Now, last uh, August when they were here, big bikes practicing on Friday, on the bikes 210 miles an hour coming down the straightaway, and then they have to chalk her down and get it through. Obviously, they're not going through these turns at 210 miles an hour. They do utilize this part. This part. We're now on Holman Boulevard, the main, main north-south artery here at the Speedway. We have had a track hospital on the grounds of Speedway since 1914. Uh, of course, it's here for the driver, for the crew, should there be an incident on the track or out on the pit road or in the garage area. However, on the race days, when we have racing events going on here, right. practice qualifications, what have you, in this building right here, which is the oldest facility inside the Oval here, it was built in 1948, it's the longest standing structure. There's 200 doctors and nurses and technicians of all kinds that can diagnose anything that you come up with. You got 250, 300,000 people in here, somebody can go maybe fall down, think they break a wrist, they come over here and they x-ray them and find out, yeah, they did, they cast them up, send them on their way, no charge to them either. All right, now, with that many people here, you might have something very serious. You may have a stroke, you may have a heart attack. That being the case, and the surface streets out here are congested because traffic moving around trying to get in the speedway and all that. Over here in, the, in this fence grassy area, there is a lifeline helicopter station there. So they get you stabilized here and decide, yeah, we need to get you down to the hospital, put you on that lifeline helicopter, have you down here to the hospital, part of the Indiana University Health System have you down there in four minutes. So you're gonna get the best of care here. That's one of the top trauma centers in the country down there at the old Methodist Hospital. Over here to the right, you see the uh, circular structure with the yard of bricks through it. This is where our VIPs come in via helicopter. We've had presidents, vice presidents, kings, queens, prince, princesses, and I mean, I mean by title from their country, not somebody that's the queen of the dairy at the state fair or something, okay? <laughs> but we've had those come in, so. Over here to the left, you see behind these uh, stake, yellow stakes, you see the motor coaches in there. This is fast car motor coaches. They're gonna start arriving now. This is where the drivers stay while they're here. All right, that's their home away from home. They don't go to Motel 6 where they left the light on for them. They pull right in here. And I don't know if Dale Jr. and Earnhardt Jr. is in, but when he opens his up, he's got a hot tub up on top. They'll pull some of these out. They got air conditioned patios in them because that's their home away from home. That's where they got to live. This area here is where the 18 wheelers are parked that, of course, bring the uh, racing machines and the latest equipment in. This area right here, this is parking for people that are on the crews that uh, uh, work back in the garage area and requires a special permit that's not just general open to the public parking. Uh, the canvas buildings on the left, why are they canvas? In Indiana, we have a law. You do not take, you do not pay property tax on temporary structures. Those are chalets now. Companies or organizations rent them and entertain their guests with food and drink. Well, about the end of October, 1st of November, the Speedway will take all the canvas down, clean it, fold it, put it away. So when the tax man comes in here and he looks at that and says, that's a temporary structure, there's no tax on that. Now, we're going to get off, we're going to be off the bus for some time. Uh, you can leave anything on that you don't want to be bothered with, such as your paperwork. It will be locked up over here. Jack will have it. No one will have access to it, so you can feel safe that way. But you certainly want to bring the cameras, because we're going to have several opportunities for camera uh, pictures. So let's go ahead and go on in. We underwent a major renovation to the physical plant here. They did that because that out of um, Formula One was coming here to race in 2000. 
they had some very specific rules. One of them was that their garages had to be on pit road, so the cars left the garage right on the pit road and out on the track. We were not configured that way here at the Speedway at that time. Everything came out of Gasoline Alley. So you saw the 36 Formula One garages that Donald alluded to on the tape when we left the start finish line. So in those days, and we still do this for the motorcycles, first place sit here, second place sit here, and third place would sit here. Back here, television cameras are uh, mounted and activated. Now the 500 and now the F1 was here, and the motorcycles now, international events. So you got people in Asia, Europe, South America interested in them. So they could get the live feed from right here, from back there that the television was all set up in, in that area. So why is it called the Chris Economaki Press Conference Room? Uh, if you're not familiar with Chris Economaki, he's probably the world's most renowned motorsports journalist. For many years, he was editor of National Speed Sport News, which was the Bible of racing. Anything that raced and you wanted to read about it, whether it was land, sea, or air, if you subscribed to Speed Sport News, you got it in your mailbox on Wednesday, and it took you on the next Wednesday to read it because there were so many articles in, in that particular publication. Now, Chris was the editor of that for many years, did a lot of television work as well. Now, uh, in later years, uh, you had the other people coming in here to cover a press conference that's going to be held. And when they came in, the other journalists, they knew Chris was on board and he was going to be here. They did not sit where this young fellow is sitting here. It didn't say on this chair reserved for Chris Economaki, but out of respect for him, they just did not sit there. When he came in, then that's where he would sit. Now, in later years here, of course, laptops, iPads, all that type of stuff. Chris come in, sit down, and open up his container. And what's he got in there? Kids, you probably have to Google this but typewriter. <laughs> and we'll see that when we go up to the media center. I'll let you grab a look at that. But he knocked out his story that you're going to read with his two fingers. And I, well, Chris passed away September 28th last year, just about three weeks, I think, short of his 92nd birthday. So in his honor, in 2006, the Speedway named this room after him. So uh, normally it's not like this. They just started decorating this morning because this is where the winner of the 400 will come in. Uh, last year, of course, it was Jimmy Johnson. He sat here. Tony Kanon, of course, was here in May. So, like I say, the winner sits here from the 500 to the 400. Uh, they don't bring the second, third place in. Just the winner, he brings his entourage in, and then they do their interview from here. So. Uh, this is, like I say, put because they're going to be sending this out all over the world, the press conferences from that. So I want to give you the opportunity to come up and get your pictures, first, second, and third. Um, notice it's a little higher here than a normal step would be, so we would ask that you please, for your own safety, watch your step getting up and down. So uh, we get started. Come on up. Jack and I will help you. And uh, you can line up on either side of the well, and that way we'll move you along. Go ahead, sir. When the physical plant was changed here, 99 and 2000, this new media center was built. Look across the track here, look above the Crown Royal sign, and you can see through there, you can, I think you can see the trees in the back, so that goes all the way through. Before this was built, that's where the media used to cover the racing events from in there. When they got up there and settled themselves in a seat, what was the first thing they did when they opened up their briefcase? They took out a couple of rocks. Why would they take out rocks? Well, well papers for keep paper yeah. for blowing. you got to remember, in the 50s, 60s, we were using typewriters. And then typewriters had paper. You didn't want your deadline in New York at 5 o'clock at 4.30, all your things going over to Dayton, Ohio, right? So that's what they would use the rocks for course because of the wind and the, the rain would blow in on them. It was cold up there if it was a cold day here. So when that, this was built, you know, what died and gone to heaven, right? Over here now. From where I stand to that cement wall back there, we're looking at the length of a football field. We're looking at 100 yards, okay? Out here in front of us, we've got approximately 325 working stations. Now when the uh, journalists are up here covering the race, they don't watch the race on the track because you're sitting over here you can't see the track all right they get all their information up here they may be listening on the radio uh, or to the radio broadcast on their headsets or tv 
but like these TVs here, the monitors, are 124 of them here. One, uh, three, five, and seven will be showing live shots out on the track. Maybe 10 trying to pass nine up in the fourth turn. Something, of course, they'll change as things happen along the race course. Then two, four, six, and eight will contain uh, general information, timing and scoring. Who's in first, who's in 15th, what's the average speed of the race, how many miles have been run, how many laps remain, uh, if there's been any yellow lights, what's the duration of them, and so on and so forth. So they'll be able to pick that information up and keep in tune. Now, when the Speedway built this, if you look here in front of the stations, you'll notice that there's two sets of electrical wiring coming in. Why is there two sets? Well, again, you have international events here. You have people from all over the world that come in here. That has Euro power as well as U.S. power. So somebody comes from across the pond and they've got uh, a laptop. Well, it doesn't run off the same electricity that we do, but they can plug it in and they are able to utilize their whole, uh, all their equipment that they have with them. So that's what those are there for. Now, uh, when we came in here, and I think some of you know this over here on the wall of Fox, uh, there's uh, Tokyo, London, New York, Speedway, and Los Angeles. Well, all right, international event again, so there's what the time is in Tokyo and London and that. But why is it say Speedway? Well, folks, right now, you're not in Indianapolis, Indiana. You are in Speedway, Indiana, okay? Speedway is a town on to ourselves. It's 13.1 square mile. In the uh, 2011, there were just a few bodies short of 12,000 residents on one of them. I live in Speedway, okay? So we have our own town manager, town council, police department, fire department, all right? And we have our own school system. The high school sports team is probably the most unique. Uh, team name in the country. I know there's a lot of lions and tigers and bears and that out there, but I doubt that there's any other school that's got a name like the Spark Plugs. <laughs> so when you go home now and somebody says, well, gee, I, I know you've been on the road and had a little vacation, where'd you go? Well, I went to Speedway, Indiana. And they kind of rub their head and say incredulously, Speedway, Indiana. I don't think I know where that is. You tell them, well, Indianapolis, Indiana, okay? It's a suburb of the street. Uh, we're going to go out on the Victory roster now. Uh, there are three levels there to get your pictures taken. I would ask, please, if you would use all three levels up and down for your safety. Lots of kids, they don't go taking a dive through them. Uh, so, uh, does anyone need to use the elevator to go down? Jack will be happy to do that. Uh, otherwise, if you'll just follow me, we're going to walk down two flights of steps. So, anybody want to raise She usually says, God bless America. Well, she was up here this year, but a young lady did. The national anthem is sung up here while the colors are presented, although this year they did the Sandy Patty album. Across the track, extend across Pit Road and underneath the pagoda. 
those are timing loops. Between the road course and the oval course, there are 25 sets of those loops in kind of different places around the track. Every vehicle that races here has mounted on it or in it a transmitter, and each one will have a course transmit to its own frequency. So like night race control up on the ninth floor, they know the transmitter number 1234 is assigned to car 98. signal up to the transmitter, the transmitter immediately gets it up here to all the computers that are set up down uh, along here. So that's how we keep track of who's in first, who's in 15th, who's in 23rd, whatever, through those timing loops. Now, extend across pit road because here at the Annapolis speed, uh, Moore Speedway, there is a pit road speed limit. For the Indy cars, it's 60 miles an hour. NASCAR, it's 55 miles an hour. Indy car, you're coming across here, say, for example, at 60.15, your crew is going to get a call from race control and say you were detected exceeding the pit road speed limit. You have incurred a drive-through penalty. What that consists of, if you came in under the yellow light and went back in and fell in under the yellow light, you have to wait until the track goes green to serve your penalty. So you're coming down this five-eighths of a mile front stretch, and less than 60, hopefully you learned your lesson, and you're less than 60, and everybody out there to your right, they don't even know they're going 200. You can just see the dollar signs floating away, because obviously the lower you finish, the less money you're going to make. If you're going to get a speeding ticket, you better get it early. So maybe you can make up some of that time you lost. If you get it late in the race, you're probably going to be a, a hurting company. So that's why we use those lines there. Now, look up there, there's the eagle's nest, crow's nest, birds, and whatever you want to call it, that's where the official starter stands, displays the flags, and, and uh, activates the lights that control the race. Uh, for the 500, uh, we have a select celebrity starter out there every year. Some in the past have been Christy Yamaguchi, the gold medal figure skater, Olympic gold medal figure skater, Hollywood actor Jack Nichols has been out there. Uh, so, uh, they get up there, and they're there with the starter. Well, he gives them a tutorial on how to wave the green flag. And I know one of the first things he tells them is three words. You got any idea what those three words are? Don't drop it. Don't, don't, don't drop, drop it. it. Yeah, don't <laughs> drop it. You're absolutely right. So what will happen when 11 rows of three are coming down the front straightaway here at about 100 miles an hour, and he's looking at them. Everybody's in the order they're supposed to be. He likes the way the spacing is out. Then he'll tap the celebrity on the shoulder. And they will then wave with the green flag, making sure they don't drop it. No one has yet. At the same time, he does that. On the fence in various places around the speedway, there are traffic signals, just like they're going to encounter back here, out here on 16th Street, when you leave the, leave the track. Red, yellow, and green. As they're coming down that pace ladder, approaching, approaching the start, they'll be yellow. There'll be a flashing yellow on top of the scoring pile. Flashing yellow here. Well, when he tells the celebrity to wave the green flag, he throws the switch and not at the base and he's traveling signal as well. Now the drivers will tell you, they're not looking up there for the green flag. Okay? They're looking straight ahead, concentrating, how am I going to get to that first corner with 32 others around me? So, well, you have to be intense around here all the time, especially going into that, uh, that first corner and you want to pay particular attention to that. So that's how we get the race started because the crews will be listening and when they see the green flag and they see on the, they're hollering in the radios to the driver, green, 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 so there the drivers are hearing that and they go ahead and get started. Look to the right of it, it's the desk and you see it uh, looks like a video camera running north and south, that's what that is, that's one of the many that's the uh, track here. I don't know. Did you say that lights out over there, Jack? Well, I, I, when we go out, I don't know if we can see in there, uh, but when we go up here to, on the other side of this last, during racing events, the blinds are closed in there. The people that are in there, no one sees in, no one sees out. They have no idea who's in first, who's in 15, who's in 33rd. They have one job that they do up there with that video camera. We have a joystick that they can move in and out and up and down. Focus in, focus out. They're looking at a s section of the pavement. They're looking at the asphalt. Is anything going on in the car? The 
it might constitute a hazard. Does something come out of the stands that might constitute a hazard? They see that, they call race control, report what they see, and he can take a look at it and he decides what we're going to do to rectify it. We're going to throw the yellow, send the safety crew out there to pick up a bottle or a can or something that might have come out of the stand before it constitutes a big problem for the, for the race event itself. So, that's what they'll do with those. Now they say those cameras are so fine. I've got a sweep second hand here on my watch, and right now it's six seconds. If I stopped it there on race day and went in there and on the morning and said, folks, my watch is out there on the track, I want you to find my watch, and I want you to tell me where that sweep second hand is. They come back in a couple of minutes at that long and say, Bill, we found your watch at the exit of turn two, and your sweep second hand is at six. It's not at six. It's out Radio and TV used to be up here in the uh, white buildings no more. If you're watching the Brick Hour 400 a uh, week from Sunday, uh, right over here to the left. That's where the announcers are going to stand. Doesn't look like much now, but we're going to be bringing in our own furniture and foliage and all that. Much more presentable than it does now. That's where they stand. So if you're watching the 400, like I say, a week from Sunday, and you see a shot of a store car on the front of the announcers and stands. And uh, that's what they were saying. Hey, that's, that's what I was right here. So that's what that. Now, the Indianapolis Speedway Radio Network, Mike King, is up on the ninth floor. Uh, that's what he calls for. He has first one sign on the second, third, fourth turn. He has four coach points up and down the pit road. He has one back in the garage area, one back in the hospital. So if there's something in an incident, somebody goes back to the hospital. Get that made to listen to the radio broadcast and we're going to find out how that person was treated or what their extent of their injuries are. And they, you know, if they walk in the back door, walk out the front door, and they would be there then. That's how Mike approaches the race of events here for the folks who watch it. Now, the closest finish we've ever had here in the past 4300 of the second, 1992. So, any questions about the timing story? I, I like I say, I don't know if we can see in there. We're going to go over to the suite now. Look to your right. That's where the TV people will be. And, uh, general public guy. Indy cars do not drive out to pit road. You can't run an Indy car at 10 miles an hour, okay? They're towed out with a golf cart. One of the crew members gets in, steers it, they have a rope tied up to the golf cart and back to the car, and they go ahead and tow it on out. Now, uh, you All right. Yeah. You're the man, Jack. Mm -hmm. All right, over here on the left, this is called Legends Row. This is uh, Chalets, again, the company's organization rent during the month of May here. These are all named for an individual who has won the 500 on two or more occasions, okay? So you see there Wilbur Shaw, he was a three-time winner, of course, here. Louis Meyer, we talked about Louis in the mail, right? He was a three-time winner here, so that's uh, what that is. Bill called it two, Bobby Edison three right on down the line and you can see they open right out into the garage area so the guests that you entertain they have access to the garages they can go in there and see the cars being prepared and ready to, to go out and get probably get some driver autographs from time to time they'll come out of the garage and sign some autographs for you now nascar like i said they drove through gasoline the alley go back to the garage area and practice that and make their changes so they want to come out this gate here, push back, all right? And then go right over here. You'll notice what? This is garage doors twice as wide as the others, so they'll go through here. The course is twice as wide out on pit road. Now, there's cars coming down pit road, there's cars coming down the track. They may be moving fast, all right? There's a NASCAR official stands in there. He doesn't want these people to go out because of the fact that there are other cars out there. So he holds up a school crossing stop sign, just like they got down the street from you to get the kids from the grade school. Now, when he does that, then you're standing right next here to that concrete barrier, and from here to where this gentleman is, 
your favorite driver might be sitting there waiting to go out and you can really get some, some good shots of them. So over here, again, like I said, uh, there's a 35 mile an hour speed limit. Doug, you'll appreciate this, I think. 35 mile an hour speed limit going through there. One day, Robbie's here with NASCAR, Robbie Gordon. He goes through there at 70. More than the uh, NASCAR and Speedway gets all upset. I'm sure that, I mean, they call him more than NASCAR hauled. I'm sure they like him to qualify a few bucks. So the moral of the story is, folks, you can be a race car driver in a race car at a race track, and you can still get a speed ticket. We are open here every day of the year except for Thanksgiving Day and Christmas Day. For your convenience, there are two souvenir gift shops inside the museum building and a massive selection of photographs dating all the way back to 1909 in the photo shop up on the second floor. If you'd like a little more history right now, you might enjoy the video in the museum's Tony Holman Theater. Your museum ticket is all you need to get in. The golf course and the Brickyard Crossing restaurant are located just outside of Turn 2. Well, that's the tour. Thank you for coming, and please visit us again at the Indianapolis Motor Speedway. How I long for my Indiana home. Myself, thank you for taking the time out of your day and your hard in dollars that you spent to go along with us. I hope maybe you picked up a couple of bits of information you didn't know when you drove through that tunnel several hours ago. We certainly encourage you to be back there any time that there's a racing event going on, and not necessarily for the race, but if you can only be here for practice and qualifications, I think you'll get a good look. So thank you. When you get off the bus, please ensure that you have all your materials that you got on with. And thank you so much for being with us. The museum's still open till 5, so you got a half an hour to go in there if you'd like.